Michael, thanks very much for giving us the interview. Um, so obviously the, the, the film is about uh, the social history of people from St. John's Park and that, the parish. And, uh, and I suppose a few things I wanted to ask you about growing up and all that kind of stuff. But first of all, just about maybe to talk a little bit about your, I suppose what you're very, I find very interesting is all the traveling that you've done all in your life. Um, and I know recently you've just back from amazing Trip. Could you tell us where you started really well recently? Oh, yeah, just back a few weeks now. I went to visit my uh, late brother's widow in Mongolia. But I suppose, you know, a normal, a normal person would just take a flight to Ulaanbaatar. But I decided to go the long way around. I, I fl actually flew to Islamabad in Pakistan, as you do. And uh, I cycled the Karakoram Highway, which is 1,300 kilometres heading north through the Kunjarab Pass, it's the highest international border in the world, into western China. And uh, from uh, Kashgar in western China, I took a three-day rail journey across to Beijing and then continued my flight up to, and uh, continued my journey up to Ulaanbaatar. So all in all, it was like a five-week journey, isn't it? Uh, six weeks in total. Okay. And, uh, I mean, and this kind of like, it gives you, people an idea of the kind of things that you do. I mean, you do a lot of mountaineering stuff and all that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah, I've been mountaineering now, I suppose, since back in the 1980s, when I went, early 1980s, 79, 80, I did my first uh, overland trip to the Himalayas and visited uh, the Mount Everest region base camp. And, you know, back then, Ollie, it was so different to, to uh, now, back there was no, uh, charity uh, hikes going there then. It was a very quiet place. Only climbers went there. And uh, it was um, an interesting time. Uh, and the journey out there was extremely interesting. Mm. Uh, encountered a revolution along the way in Iran. And uh, saw the last of the, um, the transition from rail, from uh, steam to uh, diesel locomotives in India on a 60-day rail journey I did around India. So that was... That's amazing. Oh. And that was the over the overthrow of the Shah of Iran. That's oh yeah. I mean the the, the whole. I, I took a keen interest in the whole history of that revolution, and to the point where I joined an organisation called the International Society of Iranian Studies, and uh, just a fascinating time. You know, this wasn't just what happened in Iran in in nineteen seventy nine, nineteen seventy eight, nineteen seventy nine. It wasn't just some small scale revolution like happens in South America. It was a major major revolution. Uh, akin to, to the, the, the Soviet Revolution or the French Revolution, and the, the repercussions of it are still being felt today. Yeah. You know, it was, it, it was, uh, the, the Shah was overthrown, they rejected that whole Western model, and uh, the vacuum that was created was filled by extreme Muslim, extremist Muslims, and the, that's, that's what we have today, the repercussions of that. And even, the other thing which is kind of interesting too, is that even your, um, your nephew now is a professional climber, isn't he? Or? Eric has, uh, he's just, re well, he, he started off doing uh, outdoor adventure sport and business studies in GMIT. And from that, he was, he was really upskilled through um, uh, paramedic courses and uh, uh, alpine skill courses. And, you know, they really, they, they, they trained him up well. And uh, from his training, then, he was able to apply successfully to be a full-time fireman. So that, that's what he's at at the moment. Oh. Yeah. So has he, has he put the mountaineering aside? Oh, no, no, that passion is still there. I think, you know, when somebody, you never, you might park it for a while, but it's always there, I think. Even with myself now, I am, um, you know, I haven't turned my back on mountaineering. I've, I've, in the last year or so, I've, I've taken up cycling, not competitively, but more, more leisurely. And uh, that's taken up a lot of my time now. But uh, the mountaineering is still there. You know, the passion for mountaineering will always be there. And similarly with Eric. Yeah. And as well as cycling, you've also taken up running in recent years as well. I did. Uh, my sister uh, did a marathon a couple of years ago, and uh, she asked me to... Um, I expressed an interest in, in, uh, in uh, doing, doing the marathon because I, I got quite fit in the last year in pre preparation for my, my trip along the Silk Road. Uh, and from that, uh, I realised, wow, you know, I've, I've lost quite a bit of weight. I feel very fit. And... Uh, I'm able to run, and uh, at, at age 60, I completed my first marathon a couple of weeks ago, That's in great. in around five hours. So. <laughs> That's great. Mm. And uh, so, like, 
I suppose all this, and, and just with the mountaineer, and I know you've done kind of really interesting stuff like, uh, it's like name some of the mountains that you've been on, working on. Or um, oh, like, yeah. Mount Blanc, or not Mount Blanc, signed by the, has the religious connotations in. Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat, yeah. yes. Yeah, Mount Ararat was a fantastic mountain. I, I first came across Mount Ararat in my overland trip to India back in 1979. And, uh, I, you know, there's that, that connection with the Bible and Noah's Ark. And uh, the, it's, it's in lots of literature, you know. The, the, um, Marco Polo mentioned it in, in his travels. It was a real beacon on, on the Silk Road. Uh, and, and if you saw it, it is, it's a standalone mountain in, in, in a desert. And, it, you know, it can be seen from about 100 miles away. And what I suppose Marco Polo may be set to challenge to me a little bit. He in his in his writings he in his uh, writings he, he he mentioned that the mountain was so high that uh, no man would ever reach the summit. So I, I kind of took that as a little bit of a challenge, and uh, I did climb it in nineteen in two thousand and nine. And, and you did the, the Atlas Mountains. Well. Yeah, the, the Atlas Mountains are fascinating, and they're just so close, you know, the, and, and so accessible. I mean, with, with uh, budget airlines flying, you can get down to Marrakesh now for, for small money, and they're um, a couple of hours on a bus from Marrakesh, and you're into the Atlas Mountains, and they're incredible. You know, they're, a lot of people don't associate uh, North Africa with snow, but there's much, there's more, there's snowing and skiing and 4,000 meter peaks all over. Uh, all over North Africa. And, and so here, I suppose what I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is here's this guy from St. John's Park who probably, you know, you, you weren't involved in the scouts, you weren't involved in anything like that. How did you go from, I suppose, have this kind of idea, fascination with travel and with seeing the world? Where did that come from? I'm not quite sure. I, I think it, it I think it's part of our DNA, you know. If I if I remember back as far as I can, uh, there was always I looked at um I was always fascinated by by what was outside of my immediate uh, zone and you know even when I was very young I went on a few occasions I would I would I would go to Dublin with my dad. He had a small vegetable store and we would go up to Smithfield and I loved going there. I loved arriving. I loved the journey. I loved arriving. I loved listening to all the different accents in the in the markets on on the Saturday mornings. And I think that you know for people to have the travel bug to be blessed with the travel bug, I think you need you need to have that that that's all part that comes with the package, you know. And then you know in later years I first went. I went on a, a, a interrail around Europe, and we went down to North Africa, and that was it. Was to, that was nineteen seventy seven, and that was just so, that was a real mind blower, you know, to arrive in a, in a country, especially when we went across from Gibraltar to Tangier, and to, to, it was my first time seeing that culture and and that Arabic culture and and all the bazaars and the souks and 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 it was just and the Kasbah, it was just incredible and down to Marrakesh and I remember coming back from that trip and my head was just buzzing I thought you know there really is a, a fascinating world out there and 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 then you went on an amazing journey overland to uh, to India was it or I did, yeah. That was in the, the, the interrail trip that got me hooked, I suppose, was, was in 1977. In 1978, I took a cycle tour around Europe. I cycled down over through France and across the Pyrenees, down into Spain. And that, that was an interesting trip as well. And that was, I suppose, in, it was an unusual trip at the time because it was a solo trip and people were quite amazed, you know, why, don't, why do you want to do it on your own? And, and again, you know, I, I can't answer that question. You know, I don't know why I want to do it on my own. It's just that I... I, I enjoy I, I enjoy my own company. I enjoy the solitude of, of going on a bike and arriving. And then in two thousand in nineteen ninety in nineteen seventy nine, I went overland to the Himalayas. I had uh, the 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 trip to the the cycle tour around Europe introduced me to mountains. Uh, and prior to that, the, the I'd seen the Atlas Mountains from Marrakesh. We didn't actually visit them. And that uh, there was a huge interest in exploring mountains, and uh, I wanted to go to the, um, the Himalayas, and I did. So tell me the countries you passed through on the way over to. Himalayas. Oh, the, the the route was quite. The route actually changed prior prior to nineteen seventy nine. The route from Iran went through Afghanistan, and down across the Khyber Pass 
uh, into Peshawar, down through Pakistan and into India. But after these, the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979, uh, the route changed. Uh, it went south from Tehran down to Baluchistan. It avoided Afghanistan completely because that, that was an absolute, an absolute no-go area when I passed through in December 1979. But where you started from, uh, Greece? Uh, no, yeah, I would have taken a bus from London down to Greece and then across through Turkey and uh, from Istanbul, a bus from Istanbul to Tehran and then south through the deserts uh, of uh, Baluchistan down through Pakistan and across into India. That way. Okay. I mean, that was a fair journey. Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, and I mean, I, I mean, obviously you need to have a few bob to do it, but you probably did it very cheap, did you? Oh, I did, yeah. No, I had I started my apprenticeship as a carpenter in uh, 1973. So I, I was qualified carpenter. So it was, I would go and, like I said, go to London and work for a few months and save up some money. And, you know, when you travel like that, you can, you can do it very cheap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't remember the exact figures, but I certainly wouldn't have been staying in any, any five-star hotels or anything. It would have been uh, low-budget travel. And, yeah. Yeah. and uh, to go right back then, I mean, obviously you had this sense of adventure and a sense of fun and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Go right back to your childhood in St. John's Park. Uh, can you kind of give us a picture? What was your earliest memory of growing up there? Um, I suppose my dad's shop in the square. That, that, was, that was my earliest memory. We had um, and my dad's black van and, and the smell of fresh vegetables from the store. And, you know, they're, they're all memories that, I, that, that they still... They say your sense of smell are, are, is linked to your memory. And sometimes when I walk into a vegetable shop, even today... I'm I'm right back there in that in that shop in St John's Park. So yeah, it was an interesting place. It was a new estate, and uh, everything was new and shiny, and the people were were um, enthusiastic. And we had a new school, and and uh, and Scholar Con, which which was you know within walking distance of our house, and uh, but you know our our leisure time was interesting. We had a, a natural playground in front of our house in the square. We played a lot of football. It was never really one for soccer, but there was lots of football games played in 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 the square. And uh, then for for leisure, we would have usually two choices. We if we had money, we went to the pictures on the weekend to the cinema, the matinees, the Savoy or the Regina, or there was two more. There was the Regal and the Coliseum. So there was a choice of four cinemas in Waterford, I think, at the time. And you know, we, we went regardless. If we had money, we went regardless of what was on. You know, we just we went to the went to the pictures. Uh, if we had no money, we went to um, or sometimes by, by choice we would go to the major, so to Ballinamona, to the lake, and that was a real playground for us. You know, we we spent a lot of time out there. Most of my friends learned to swim there. Uh, we would spend many days of our summer holidays out there, and you know, we went looking back like we were. We almost went feral, you know. We were like Amazonian children. We would go out there, and we would, you know, we'd be swinging out of trees and, and diving in the water, and you know, having great fun. And you know, we, we there was um, the guy that owned the place at the time, Major Carew. You know, he was a really sound man. You know, he 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 tolerated us trespassing on his property. Looking back on it, and there was a few rules that that nobody actually. I don't know if he actually made the rules, but they, they were quite definite. There were no dogs allowed no fires and no throwing, no interfering with the, with the flora and fauna. They were the three rules and we, we, we adhered to those. And, you know, we had our principles as well, you know, so we would, it, it wasn't very difficult for us to, and I think the, the idea of the not having dogs was, it would upset the wildlife in, in the pond, the, the swans and, and, and the ducks and the, the water hens, etc. But uh, an interesting um, time in in our lives there was no there was that, that there was no um women involved you know we, we were children and we didn't socialize with girls you know there was that division i don't know if that came from the the uh, single sex schools or the christian brothers or or the, the catholic religion but we didn't actually socialize with women or with girls and and you know there, there was often up to maybe 100 children out in the majors on a sunny on a sunny day at the weekend but no women and you know, some of us would, would would swim in our underwear. Some of us would swim naked, and uh, occasionally girls would appear, one or two girls, and uh, they would be panic. You know, they'd be shouting, they'd be fellas in the water naked. They wouldn't be able to come out, and was, so um, ah oh, yeah, like really, really, really great memories of of Ballinamona. And what other places would you get to out there, out in the, out the country, sir? 
uh, we would we would do a little bit of uh, exploring. I remember uh, we'd we'd walk across the field sometimes rather than take take the road. We would uh, t- take an alternative route across the field, and that would um, annoy some of the farmers, you know. And we knew we knew the, the the farmers that were quite agitated by us going on on their land, and sometimes we would actually. Um, uh, harassed him so we would get a chase, you know, <laughs> and uh, that was uh, you know oh, just a bit of fun. And you'd also head off to the beach sometimes, would you? We would, yeah. The um, yeah, it was the 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 beaches were uh, Tremor, Woodstown, and uh, Dunmore. Now my parents weren't particularly or weren't particularly fond of us going to Dunmore. I think my dad considered that to be a little bit dangerous for some reason. Uh, Woodstown was it was a funny one. See, back then we would um, Saturday morning was was spent fixing punctures on tire on on wheels and and uh, you know trying to get bicycles together and fix you know the, the the serious one would be a pedal if there was a pedal damaged on a bike you know that was uh, we we were never able to sort that one out. But uh, there, there would be ten or twenty of us head off on bikes out to Woodstown. Now at, we didn't have the wherewithal to check the tides, so sometimes we'd arrive in Woodstown and we'd be devastated because there was no water there. <laughs> the, the tide had be gone out. Now we did on occasion go out, walk out as far as Craden Head for a swim, um, which again, you know, the parents wouldn't have been too happy about that. And we um, again, Tremor again would be another place. But one of the most interesting uh, trips to Woodstown was back in the. I don't know the exact dates. I can check it. But we were cycling down the, um, the hill into Woodstown, and some guys came out with suits to stop us, and uh, they had American accents, and we thought that they were Mormons because there was a lot of Mormons around Waterford at the time. Now, they didn't quite understand their accents. They, they were asking us where we were going. And, of course, we were telling them, well, we're going for a swim on the beach. Why? And they had radio radios, and they allowed us through. But when we got to the beach, uh, yeah, you probably know where this is going. Uh, Jackie Kennedy and her children were on horseback on the beach. So, And my memory of that is the, um, the black shiny hair and the brown skin and the, the shiny boots and the really chestnut-coloured horses. Everything was... Did they speak to you? Oh, no, no, no. But we were we were we were weren't considered a security risk, so we we were allowed through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, so yeah, so well, you mentioned um, Scholar O'Connor and all that. Well, what was your memory of school there? I mean, was it, it was a new school? Wasn't it? It was a new school and uh, the Christian Brothers with their, with their garb, you know, and, and the dusters and the choke and, and the corporal punishment. And they, they, were, they were young men who were, who were trained up to deal with, with, um, with, the, with the education system at the time. And it was, it was an int- you know, it had its faults, you know, the, probably the main one was, was the corporal punishment. I mean, that, that they were, I have to say, some of, some of the, the, the punishment they, they dished out was quite brutal, you know, and, and, and psychological as well, not, not, physical, not, not, not only the physical stuff. But, they, you know, they, on, on a positive note, they, they, um, they did their best and uh, we, we, we came out the other end of it. But, you know, they had a, a very difficult task, you know. They had a classrooms of up to 43 children. There was a huge focus on, on, um, on, on the Irish language uh, and... There was uh, probably one of the, the biggest um, objections I had, or difficulties I had with the with the the, the system at the time was, it, it's like that we were all categorized. When when we got went into a new class and we had a new teacher, the the the, in, the teacher would go around and make every pupil stand up and state what their father worked at. Now I always curious to know what was the what was the point of that, you know, and ask uh, as well, you know, and and you know. M- Many children would stand up and say, you know, Neil uh, you know, and that that was kind of it was it was humiliating for them, and I, I suppose they were put way down in the pecking order then in in, in the classroom in in the teach in the teacher's eyes. I assume that that's why they asked, you know, people whose fathers were had government jobs, they were they were brought up to the front of the class. So that was that was a little difficulty I had with the. The system at the time. And so after after school at Cone, did you go up to Nancy? No, I went to the Tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And were you were you at that stage? Were you interested in getting an apprenticeship? And all that yeah, I I found that they they, they I took uh, I 
was introduced to subjects in the tech that I hadn't come across in, in, in the primary school at all, you know, things like mechanical drawing and woodwork and science and all those, those subjects were very interesting to me and I, I took a, a keen interest in, in, the, uh, in the mechanical drawing and, uh, and from that then I, I started my apprenticeship as a carpenter and uh, I, I, I suppose it, it, it tapped into a, a skill that, that I had, you know, or a, a, an aptitude that I had. And like you, you came from a big family. Uh, mm. I mean, like there was. Uh, I mean, I don't want to repeat what the Christopher Brothers were, but I mean, <laughs> just your your mom and dad they, were they both from Waterford? They were, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And what was your mother's maiden name? Uh, Nolan. My mother was from uh, Wilkins Street off Passage Road, and my dad was from what they considered the other end of the town. He was from Griffith Place. And you know, they met when they were quite young. You know, my mum was just a teenager when she married. So she she was um uh, was quite young. Um never really talked to them much about that, but I think there was something to do with with uh, my dad was was a boxer and uh it, by all accounts he was a bit of a glamour boy as well and uh, I suppose he would have been, you know, a man about town and so but uh, I don't know the the venue where they met or, or you know, no. And did he encourage you to get to boxing? Um, he would have, uh, yeah, he, he, he encourages us, yeah, uh, uh, that's a difficult question, now. I'm not sure how I should answer that. No, he was probably, he didn't force us to box, or, or he wouldn't have, um, no, he certainly, he wouldn't have encouraged us to box, no, I think he just left it up to ourselves, that's probably the best answer but I can come up with. Um, no, I don't think, not in my, not to my memory, oh, no, there, there was, was later on. yeah, yeah. Okay. And did you, uh, um, so yeah, just in relation to your parents then, so were they, were, when they, were they living in Waterford before they moved in, out to St. John's Park or were they, did they, was, when they got married, did they move out to St. John's Park? I think they, yeah, they, when, when they got married, they, I think originally they had a flat in town shortly after they got married and then they were, they relocated the house, yeah. So there were two townies really? Oh yeah, yeah. And do they like living up in St John's Park, or do they find it a bit far out from town? Or I think no. I I think they they enjoyed it, and you know, actually a, a big um, we had a big change uh, after about four, but see, but after about six or seven years, because the house we were allocated originally only had two bedrooms. And then we had to move, and I, I didn't like that move at all. We, we moved from the square, which there was a real sense of community, to um, the main road, which is now the airport road. We moved up there, and I just, I just I didn't like that move at all for some reason. And I don't think my parents did either, but they, they had no choice, really, because the, the new house that we, we... Because there were so many of us, we needed a three-bedroom house, and uh, the, the move was, was uh, out of necessity. Mm. Yeah. And then, I, uh, I mean, I know I'm jumping way around an awful lot, but you eventually uh, met someone from St. John's Park yourself. I did indeed, yeah. yeah my, my current wife is uh, <laughs> from, from St. John's Park. And uh, we, met, um, we met in Dublin, actually, yeah, in, in, um, in the early 80s. And uh, she's, uh, and, you know, I never, I, she's a couple of years younger than me, not, not many, two or three years, two years younger than me. And, uh, but I wouldn't have known her. I mean, John's Park was quite a large uh, housing estate, and I suppose with with the age gap, it's not apparent now, but it probably back then, you know, when you're eighteen, uh, the age gap would have been a little bit apparent. So she she wasn't somebody that I knew, growing up in St John's Park, but I met her many years later in Dublin. Yeah. yeah. How did you meet her? Was that just a party? A uh, party in Dublin. Yeah, I was actually home from. Um, I'd been working in the Middle East at the time in Saudi Arabia, and I was home on holiday, and uh, yeah, at a party in Dublin, and yeah. Love stories begin. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and her her family have an interest in, uh, like I know Dick passed away recently. So do you want to just say, tell us a little bit about? Uh, he had a very interesting claim to fame in that he was involved in the Second World War, wasn't he? He was. Look, Jared's uh, father-in-law, and you know he he was such a gentleman, and you know I'm I know him since I first met Jar back in nineteen eighty three, and I have to say. It's. I've never heard him say a bad word about anybody in, in all those years, in those uh, 30, 34, 32 years that I knew him. If The worst I ever heard him say about somebody, if he really disliked somebody, he, he, the worst he could say about them was, uh, I can't make that fella out at all. 
I mean, that's it's in, that's that's uh, he he knew something. Yeah, you know, that stood him well. You know, there was no no anger in him or anything. That 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 was it was incredible. You learn you can learn a lot from older people, but yeah, he was he sadly passed away in in uh, in twenty fifth of February this year, and you know I got I got to know him very well, especially in his later years, and. He 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 was an interesting man, and he had an interesting history in that he he um, he worked all his life in um, in originally with Galway's, and then uh, when that was taken over by Gilby's, he stayed on as the dep uh, depot manager, and uh, he retired in in um, quite some time ago now, about 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 nineteen eighty seven. So, but he had a long, long and happy retirement. But yeah, he he went to uh, he went to war in um, in nineteen forty two, I think. But uh, he joined the RAF, and you know, when he did, uh, before he passed away, he was actually the oldest surviving uh, veteran in Waterford. He he went to um, he was in the RAF in in a ground crew in uh, between Egypt and Sudan. And uh, he he told us a lot of stories about about and life. He, why did he join? I'm just curious. Like from I know Water had a big connection with the British Army and all that. Yeah, stuff. I know his father was in the trenches in the First World War, so there would have been a military history in in the um, in the family, and you know it, it, it's incredible at at his funeral. Uh, and Dick, uh, Dick Lanigan would have been involved with the church for many years, especially since he retired. He was on the committees, and he he would have been involved in. Uh, in in uh, counting the money, the collections, and lodging it on the Tuesday and things like that, and you know many of the people in in the church never even knew he was in the army. But that was that was um, a, a, that was common at the time because people people didn't talk about it. There was the whole you know the the Irish British thing was going on as well, and people that came back from the war, it wasn't um, the done thing to speak about it. So he he was able to keep all that. Um, Bottled up, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And you, I remember you telling me before, but when in, when you were a child in St John's Park, that you remember a man who was in the Boer War. That's right. Yeah. 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 How was that? There was uh, when we moved out up to the airport road, Kennedy Road. There was a neighbour of ours, uh, Mrs. Gordon. Now her her maiden name was Brown, and the, her family were originally from the um, Pierce Park. Now her father would come to visit her in uh, on a certain day of the week. I don't know, was it a Tuesday or a Thursday? But he always took the bus to um, outside Teebies, where the bus turned. That was the last stop. The bus turned there. He would get off the bus, and he would walk the 100 yards or so up to her house. Now this, this would have been in the, early in the early 1970s, about 1971 or 72. And this man had a wooden leg. And uh, he walked with a, with a limp, obviously, because it, it was leg. Now... I'm just doing the maths on this. He lost that leg, I think, through infection in the Boer War in the, eight, in the late 1890s in, 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 in South Africa. So there was a, there's a link uh, with somebody who fought in a war in Africa in the 1800s. It's incredible. I suppose back then he would have been in his 90s, so which would have made him like a, a late teenager or early 20s back in the Boer War. So, yeah, I did know... Um, Mrs. Gordon's father, or grandfather, maybe, maybe her grandfather, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? That yeah. All that time that you mm. link up. Yeah. And can you remember the other characters around, knocking around St. John's Park, you know, older people, when you were young? You know? oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, sure, yeah. Uh, when we lived in the square, I told you about, I mentioned about the soccer matches that went on, and uh, they were, um, there was Ned Dewberry, of course. Ned, Ned was, was uh, you know, he was a legend, really, you know, he was such a, such a keen interest in soccer and in encouraging people to play the game, and uh, he was obviously involved in in, in the club. He was when when Johnville moved out to St John's Park. He was uh, he was involved in that for many years. I think I'm not a soccer player myself, so I don't know the the, the he's exact a big link. Man, he? Oh, he's a big man, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was he was a character around. Um, uh, there was lots of characters here yeah, around St John's Park. There was the uh, Shawnee Reynolds, of course. Shawnee was a legend, you know. Shawnee was, Sha I think Shawnee had a brother that went to sea, and uh, and uh, it was in the Merchant Navy or something. And he obviously came back and told all these stories to Shawnee. But in Shawnee's own head, Shawnee was the adventurer, you know. And he he told the stories as as though it was him. 
that that was, and he would talk about when I was five miles off the coast of Casablanca in a storm, and you know he would never, he was never there. But I suppose the funniest one with Shawnee was we were we were coming home from the majors one one day. Shawnee was a couple of years older than us, so he had that sort of influence over us, whether we liked it or not. And uh, we were coming home from the majors one evening after a swim, about ten of us, and Shawnee decided that we were going to take a shortcut. Now, I wondered where the shortcut was because the road is pretty straight in from the majors. So he took us across the fields and uh, we, we got lost. We had no idea where we were and need, neither did Shawnee. And he, we were asking them, where are we now? And he told us that we were, he was telling us things like we're five miles east of St. John's Park. <laughs> And we were like, we're we going to get home before dark now. But he, and you know, if you argued with him, that, that you, you wouldn't dare argue with him. But he was, uh, he was certainly a character. Yeah, great imagination. Yeah, Johnny. Yeah. And would you? I mean, would you have heard stories about traveling and all that and all that growing up I mean, from people like that had been away at ships and all that? Things? Not so much. No, I. I it, most people that travelled back then were, were um, people that travelled, but that went to sea, and they would have stories about, uh, I, I don't know, some sometimes adult stories about brothels in Shanghai or something like that. But no, there weren't too many people that did uh, around St John's Park at the time that did the overland thing. I know uh, uh, Brendan Gloucester uh, did some some travelling. Uh, I, I know he worked. Did he work for a while, or was he? I know he'd been to Istanbul and spoke about the the grand bazaars in Istanbul. So, but I didn't know of anybody else, apart from you know from Saint John's Park that had done those type of journeys. Now, and you know even you know when when I was preparing for my overland trip to the Himalayas back in 1979, I was in London for a few months, and I came across Darvilla Murphy's book Full Tilt in the library there and I was amazed wow you know it's not just me there's some there's more people out there that that, that have these ideas and of course you know we, we, we all know a terrible story she took off from from Waterford on, on a bicycle in 1963 which was incredible and with even, her daughter and uh, no no the original trip was she was she was a single she she didn't have any children at the time no she was she just finished um caring for her mother uh, she was a 29 year old she 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 had been caring for her mother, and then when her mother passed away, she took to um to the road and cycled to India. Yeah. Right. And I believe that I don't know if it's that book or another one of her books is still voted one of the best cycling books ever. I'd say full tilt is yeah yeah, but she she's done numerous trips uh, since then, many of them by bicycle and and uh, some some by by mule and and. Yeah. Is she still alive? Oh, she's still going. Actually, there's a, a film just released about her, uh, who was Derville Murphy, and I just heard uh, a couple of days ago that it's now um, it's been included on the transatlantic flights with Aer Lingus, so on, on board viewing. So, yeah, and she deserves it, you know. Just she deserves that type of recognition. Yeah. And so, uh, what's uh, have you anything in your head as regards future trips that you want to do? Any hard ones coming up? Um. Yes. Yes, and yeah. Um. I. I suppose I. I better. T yeah, I haven't told my wife about this one yet. But, uh, the. Um. Yeah. There's some friends of mine that we. I've been to Nepal many times since my first trip to the Himalayas, and uh, most recently in 2014, uh, two years ago, and prior to that, uh, 2012. Now the group that I went with in 2012, they want to return. Uh, next year in April May 2017 to climb Mira Peak which is around the back of Mount Everest it's a quiet route and the route is similar to the the Everest route uh, about 40 years ago it doesn't have that you know the internet cafes and fake Starbucks and all of that it's more um much more more um authentic route around the back of Everest and less crowded so we'll do that uh, next year but the interesting thing because of my recent um reintroduction to to cycling i hope to uh fly out a couple of weeks early uh to delhi and uh, cycle from delhi to Kathmandu and meet up with the group with the group in Kathmandu. it's an 18 day cycle and uh, it'll be a little bit different to the last trip but to the trip i did a few weeks ago uh, in that it will be low level and it'll be in jungle conditions in southern nepal but uh, i look forward to it it'll be different and uh Sounds fantastic. Yeah. And you mentioned to me earlier on too about a young guy who's traveling at the moment. So I think yes. Um, that because sometimes people think, oh, geez, that's, you can't do that anymore, but you can. 
Oh yeah. Now look, they, when I travelled to, to um, when I decided to cycle the Silk Route, the, also known as the Karakoram Highway, from Pakistan into China, you know, I didn't just stick a pin in the map. Uh, I, I put a lot of research into, into that journey and I'm well aware of the security situations and, and et cetera in Pakistan. But, you know, we're not always, we, we, we're not in control of everything and sometimes, you know, security situations can change or there can be things like natural disasters, which there were. They had unprecedented rainfall in Pakistan in March and April this year and it resulted in, in the Karakoram Highway being, being damaged with rockfall. And uh, so there was a lot of challenges along the way. But when I arrived into China, I saw this guy coming towards me on a bike and you know something, before, before he reached me, before I reached him, I, I thought he, he looks Irish for some reason. Now, uh, he didn't look Irish when I saw him. When I, he, like he had baggy trousers, he had a beard. He had, uh, he, this guy had been cycling from um, New Zealand. He'd been on the road since uh, January 2015. But he was Irish, or he is Irish. He's from Skibbereen in Cork. His name is Daniel Ross. He's 22 years old. And uh, he's cycled, cycling from New Zealand to Ireland. He, at the, I'm following him on his blog at the moment and I'm, I'm also uh, whatsapping him but uh, he's, uh, he's now in Iran and I told him that you know you can look forward to having a really good time when you get to Iran because the hospitality is just unbelievable and he's enjoying that hospitality at the moment. I just uh, read up about his uh, progress yesterday morning. And he's due to be here in September? Uh, September, yeah. Oh. Now, my mission before then, I'll, pro I'll have to go and his dad runs a vegetable market down on Sunday morning in Skibbereen. So uh, I'll have to go down and have a chat with his dad before he comes home and uh, tell him, you know, I met your son in Western China and uh, he's, he's good, yeah. And, and that hospitality thing, I think you should make, mention that because an awful lot of people now talk about, they'd be saying things about Arabs or they'd be saying things about other cultures. But isn't it true how hospitable these people are? I think yeah. I think a lot of it is how you are yourself. You know, if I and I think I, I that I I learned a lot from my cycle trip as well this year. You know, when I when I was arriving in in small towns or even large towns in China on my bike, I think if you're down there with the local people, uh, I, I I'd stop at the traffic light and I'd look around and there'd be there'd be hundreds of people around me all smiling and I'm an object of curiosity for them, and and they're obviously objects of curiosity for me, but. I think that there's there's a lot of psychology involved. You know, if if you if you arrive in a town, in in a big four wheel drive, and you book you you pull up outside a an extravagant a hotel foyer and book in, and you know you you're not really uh, communicating with the local people. I think, it, but you know, cycling is such a, a lovely way to travel and and see a country, and uh, that that's um, one of the joys of cycling as well. And you know, the hospitality thing. I always thought that, you know, if I travel to some place like uh, Morocco or, or India, you know, I'll expect people to be trying to sell something to me or, or uh, if they, if they, um, they want me to, to, to uh, go and stay in their hotel, their, their cousin's hotel or their friend's uh, bed and breakfast. So I expect that. And, you know, it's part of the culture there. But I always thought Iran was, was the only country where there's a sort of uncon unconditional hospitality. They, 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 you're, they're not trying to sell you something. You know, it's just, it's just pure hospitality. Um, I don't try to analyse that stuff too much. I just accept it for what it is. Sometimes, you know, I, I read where it's, uh, what, what, did, what, what are they gaining from it? It's a kind of a status thing with them. They want to be seen with a Westerner. You know, maybe, maybe that's true, but you know, they're, they're, they're sort of thoughts that, that I don't want to go too much into. Yeah. But there are, um, you know, people, people are nice. They're, they're, most people are nice out there, you know. And, and, yeah, yeah. Okay, listen, uh, Michael, that's fantastic. Uh, and long may you travel, and I hope you outdo Darren Murphy in her. <laughs> Her fantastic career. So, uh, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you.